and I wanted to I want to thank everyone um, for joining tonight. I know you have a lot of uh, informational and educational options on a Wednesday night in March, and we're thankful that you are on with us tonight. Uh, hopefully, you will get it'll be beneficial. You get something out of tonight's uh, workshop. I'm sure you will. Um, but I just wanted to um, welcome you again. My name is Rob Kastner with Wayne Soil and the Water. Uh, Taylor Gilmore or Taylor Noble is uh, also on here with Wayne Soil and the Water. And of course, our special guest speaker, Gary Horsberger from Holmes Lab will be speaking tonight too. So uh, what we're planning on doing is uh, uh, we plan to have the presentation go about 45 minutes to 50 minutes tonight. But we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time for questions afterwards. So um, we just want to uh, request that you mute uh, your microphone. It looks like everyone has. And just save your questions till the end of the presentation. Um, if you want to send something during the presentation, you can use the chat function at the bottom um, of the screen. And uh, just want to let you know if you miss anything during the presentation, that um, we are recording it and we will have it available on our website along with all of the handouts that we reference during tonight's presentation. Um, as uh, we could tell with the, it didn't seem like it about two weeks ago, but now that the snow is all melted and the temperatures are warming up, if your yard looks anything like my yard, which is shown on the screen here, um, then you probably feel like uh, it's time to start thinking about how you can get your grass growing and have a nice, robust, good looking lawn uh, for this year. And so that's those are some of the tips we're going to go over tonight. And uh, we want to do it also in an environmentally friendly way in a way that, that we're not going to be uh, putting too many nutrients to the soil or that too many nutrients might run off uh, into our gutters or ditches near our lawns. So um, Wing, so on the water between Taylor and I, we will cover uh, the grass cutting and uh, taking care of the yard waste and the composting. And then uh, Gary will speak on aeration, soil testing, and fertilizers. I will let Taylor take it away. All right, thanks Rob. So we'll kick off with grass cutting height. Um, how high should I cut my grass? So when in doubt, always mow high. Um, you can see in this schematic to the right here, um, a good cutting height is around the three to 3.5 inches. Um, so by mowing high, you're giving your grass the chance to deepen their root system, to strengthen their system, um, and become more lush and green, everything that, that we want in a yard. Um, so, and something else to remember uh, when mowing, uh, mow in a different direction each each time. So if you're mowing vertically one one time, make sure the next time you mow, mow horizontally. Um, that prevents uh, ruts forming in your yard. Um, and it also helps your grass to grow, grow upright and not lean to any sort of specific side. Um, but mulching mowers, uh, make sure you have a mulching mower blade. Uh, that breaks down the the grass into smaller pieces so that can be easily decomposed on your yard. Um, and you can also uh, pick up your, your yard clippings and put them in your uh, composter, which Rob will talk about later in the presentation. Um, so that's pretty much uh, my spiel on the grass cutting height. There's really nothing much to it. Um, I know sometimes when you mow high, it doesn't really look like you've mowed, <laughs> but it it'll help in the long run. So we will move on to aeration. Um, so Gary, you can take this away. All right, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Taylor touched about uh, the correct mowing height. Um, the reason aeration is so important, a lot of our soils um, in this area, uh, we tend to have uh, a little bit extra clay content and the clay uh, gets very compacted. And in addition to the importance of why we mow higher at three and a half inches, not only do we have more root system down below, which can bring up more nutrients, and if it gets a bit dry uh, in a drought situation, 
when you have a, a deeper root system, uh, you'll tend to still find some water down there, which will keep your yard nice and green. Uh, another thing about uh, when you look at your lawn grass, most of them today might be um, Kentucky bluegrass with other varieties. The depth of the root system is primarily about three to four inches deep. But uh, if we do have some blood clay content, when you tend to mow the yard short, and, and I've met a lot of people that like about two and a half inches because they think it looks nicer, but just remember the soil gets uh, so much hotter with the sun, the shorter you have grass up on top, the more the sunlight comes down and actually increases the temperature of the soil. And what happens when you take clay and you introduce a lot of heat to it, we tend to form bricks or um, it just forms, it really gets hard, it gets compacted. And then when it does rain, if you have some hard compacted uh, soil in your yard, if it rains, does the water penetrate down through or does it just run off? And so the topic of what I wanna discuss as far as soil testing, interpreting the test report, putting on the proper lime and fertilizer, uh, I'm gonna call it harvesting the rainwater. So when it does rain, uh, we'll have some slides that actually show you how many thousands of gallons of water could be added to your yard if we could save it and harvest it by, harvesting means first we have to collect it in our yard, then harvesting it is when the water then goes up into the root system and goes up into the blade of grass. Uh, at the lab, we do a testing on different grass as far as uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, major trace minerals, and moisture content. And the moisture content of your grass is about 80% water. So that's one of the most important things. So, um, like you look at the aeration, all aeration does, it, we can call it, it takes out a plug and it just removes the actual plug from the soil. Uh, on the left, we have the, uh, it's a, a has an engine on it. All you have to do is squeeze the levers and you walk behind it and it, it propels itself through. Uh, the right hand, which is uh, from the Toro company, uh, they have different type of pull behind units. Uh, I have one that's about three foot wide and has a nice bracket on top that I pull behind my garden tractor. And we can actually put some heavy cement blocks on it to just weight it down a little bit more. And one thing about the, when you, and you can rent these aerators, we'll show that on the next slide. Uh, when you have an aerator, you do not want to um, pull it over a, a gravel driveway because once you get some small gravel stones, either limestone or gravel stones into, because those, those uh, pipes are actually hollow pipes. They're really sharp. And it's a hollow pipe. So when it goes down in the soil, it's gonna pull out a plug. If you happen to get some stones stuck in the, the opening of that hollow pipe, you're no longer pulling out a plug. So do not uh, go places where there might be a lot of extra gravel. But plugging, it, if you plug too early in the springtime when the soil is very wet, it's gonna be too mushy and you're just gonna poke a hole in it. It's not gonna remove a plug. So try to be patient in the springtime. Uh, wait till the soil or the moisture uh, starts getting a little bit less in the soil. Uh, possibly around Memorial Day when it gets firm enough that when you do plug it, you'll see some nice plugs laying out on top. But remember, if, if it's too warm, too high a temperature on the surface of the soil, not only does it get compacted, but um, sometimes there's, there's weed seeds laying all over our yard. So if you mow short and you have, a, if the temperature increases, some of those weed seeds are going to germinate and you're going to get... Um, uh, more weeds in your yard, then what do we do? We go to the garden center, we buy more herbicide to put on. So actually, if we follow a, a customized program, you're going to find out that we can actually decrease the amount of herbicides we put on. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So by aeration, uh, we noticed that uh, uh, you have extra water, oxygen, and nutrients. Uh, actually getting down to where the root system is, again, this is three to four inches down. And when you look at the, the microbes, uh, Taylor was talking about the importance of a mulching mortar blade, which makes the particles uh, shorter and they'll fall down through that three and a half inches of a blade of grass and they'll, they'll land right on the surface of the soil. Uh, some people will call that a thatch layer. But if the microbes are properly taken care of, 
that's their food source. And she mentioned the word uh, decomposting. It's like that's their food source along with the other organic matter in the soil. But the microbes are aerobic uh, microbes. And that means that they need water, they need oxygen and nutrients. And so by aeration, uh, we're going to uh, break up some of that hard compacted clay surface. We're gonna mow it high enough. And another reason for mowing it three and a half inches is um, when you look at all of the, um, the, the solar collecting panels that are in some of our roofs around the area, a blade of grass is like a solar collecting panel. The taller it is, such as three and a half inches long, it's like increasing the solar collecting capacity and what happens in a blade of grass, you have the sunlight coming down and it's photosynthesis, which is a term that says, we're gonna use uh, oxygen from the air, we're gonna use carbon availability, we're gonna use the sunlight to make sugars. And the sugars then will go down the root system and start feeding more of the microbes. Again, another food source for the microbes. So what can they do? They multiply, they increase. Now we have greater number of population of microbes, which can uh, decrease uh, the, the amount of uh, grass clippings that go down there. And remember the one picture in the middle that says nutrients are going up. The when you have the grass clippings, they have to be digested first to go back into the original nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, all the trace minerals has to be in an individual form but then they have to be soluble in the water to get back up into the root system to supply all the nutrients that's needed to again, to get that grass to grow. So uh, this is so important with the aeration. And uh, when you think of, when you have clay, those fine root hairs are so difficult to expand uh, because the clay is so hard. And when, when you physically take out that plug out of the soil and you feed it, uh, and we're gonna talk about that's the proper time to put on any corrective lime or fertilizer, maybe some compost, because it can get down into there. Now, some people do not like the plug, and I'm, I'm just telling you some of the comments we hear. Some of them do not like the plug because they do not like those plugs laying on top of the soil. But when you look at this schematic that you have here, um, the important thing is to try to make the microbes uh, more efficient. They get a deeper root system. And all those plugs that came out, and when I plug my yard, I go, uh, I go one direction, then I go back and I go 90 degrees the other direction. So my yard is just full of plugs. But the truth is, all those plugs will uh, they'll dissolve and fill right back in again. So uh, Taylor, how about the next slide? Let's see what, we were, what we're getting into here. Uh, these are some other, uh, you might say, well, I, you could buy some of this equipment, like the pole behind plugger. You can buy that, maybe a few people can go together and, and um, rent it, or maybe actually purchase it and, and use it uh, as a sharing, or you can uh, rent it a lot of these different places. But again, wait till the soil is, is warm enough, uh, it's uh, uh, hard enough so a nice plug comes out. So, uh, and there's more, uh, there might be other uh, opportunities other than what this is, but it just tells you that they are available out there. All right, how about number six, Taylor? Okay. Uh, why do we soil test? And uh, so many times we might just go to the home garden center, uh, uh, maybe a, a box store garden center, and we see lawn fertilizer and we buy some of that. We have some weeds, so we buy some herbicides, either a, a liquid or some of it's granular put in with the fertilizer. Um, but what if we're just putting something on that we don't need? What if the, uh, we're going to talk a bit later, what if the pH is so low that the microbes are stressed, they're not expanding, they're not reproducing, they're kind of stagnant. And what if we mow short and the root system is shallow? If we go and just buy something because uh, it's on sale or everybody, uh, we get in this, in the springtime, we get in this mood, we had enough of the winter, we just wanna go buy something and put on the yard. But what if we're putting on something that we don't need? Or what if we buy something that isn't correcting the problem? So I'm gonna let you read why it's important to swallow test up there at the top. Uh, all I wanna point out to you is um, you need to go down about four inches, four inches down and take random subsamples from, uh, walk all around the yard. You can zigzag to the end of the yard, maybe come back on the other half of the yard, but you wanna take all these different subsamples and then put your hands in a bucket and break them up. Uh, you can get those probes on eBay, for example, it's a stainless steel probe. And if you use that, you're gonna to have to punch out, the, it's like a, a real hard 
piece of soy, you got to punch it out and then you have to break it all up. The right hand side, it's a bit of a crude um, design, but it's a five gallon bucket. It's a five gallon bucket with a cordless drill and then some type of auger that you can, and you have a hole in the offset on the bottom of the bucket. So when you push the auger down, you can put a piece of um, masking tape about uh, four or five inches on that auger bit. So when you push it down through that hole in the bucket, when the masking tape is right at the bottom of the bucket, you know you have your four inches underneath. The nice thing about that bucket on the right-hand side that when you bring it up, you move it over to the solid part of the bottom and the soil is already crumbled. And if the soil is a little bit hard, when you have an actual drill that's going down into the soil, if it's a little bit dry or hard, it'll still take a nice subsample. But the whole idea is you can take it wet or dry, uh, you mix it all up and then take your quart Ziploc bag. But uh, you can read about the importance of soil testing. Again, Rob talked about being efficient. We don't want to waste it. If, if the soil is really hard and we're mowing short, whatever we do put on the, I mean, just logically think of this. If we have compacted soil, we're move, mowing it short, the root system shallow, whatever we apply to that, whether it's a lime or fertilizer herbicides, if you get a heavy rainfall and the water's not taking all those, those items you put on down into the soil, everything is washing off. I mean, it, it makes sense, does it not? It washes off, goes into storm sewer. Maybe you have, uh, you live near a creek and, and everything you're buying is going off. So what can we do to our soils that when it does rain, we want to keep it there? I mean, uh, I know a lot of folks have this automatic sprinkler system and they're using well water or city water to do that. But why don't we create an environment on our own yard that when it does rain, and then we have a deep root system when it does rain, we want it to stay right there. And so that's what I want to focus our presentation on. All right, number seven, Taylor, let's see what we're getting into here. All right, so here we collected the sample and here's an example of a report. Now, if you notice on the report, the, the units are pounds per acre. Um, there will be some uh, different labs use different units. The testing is all the same, but uh, this is an example, pounds per acre. Others might use a term called PPM, but the test results uh, at the top, you'll see the uh, pH is 6.2, organic matter, and then you have a phosphorus and potassium. And right now we don't know if those are good numbers or not, but I just put a little comment on that, it's slow. And the, the next slides we get to, we'll talk about that, but I wanna let you know that, so there's the results uh, up at the top and uh, cation exchange capacity, um, that's all the cations, which are the positive minerals in the soil. Positive minerals would be calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. Those are the plus charges in the soil. And when you have a, a soil that has ability to hang on to those plus charges, if you notice, those are the, the items in a bag of fertilizer, the phosphorus, the potassium. And, and then uh, down at the bottom, we have recommendations. And the reason we were putting a little bit of lime on down at the bottom, 37 pounds per thousand square feet, and many labs will have a per thousand square feet. So you wanna make sure you take an accurate measurement, uh, one dimension, one side toward and times the other side, you get your square feet. And, but it says we need some lime. How do we know which kind of lime to put on? So up on the top right hand side under comments, you're gonna see use high uh, calcium lime. And we're using that because we want to, in the middle section, you see base saturation. Uh, we're a little bit low on calcium. So if we put on a high calcium lime, it does two things. It raises the calcium level and also going to bring that pH up about 6.5. Uh, and then it's actual units down at the bottom. And what does that mean? We need some phosphorus and potassium. All right, next slide. Um, so when you look at the, the pink uh, or the kind of the off-color off sheet on the left-hand side, again, why do we do a swell test? And we want to try to get it up to 6.5. Why should we do that? If you look at the chart, um, the horizontal, the, it says availability of nutrients. And if you notice the top three numbers are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium going horizontally, the thickest part. And if you look vertically, why do we want a 6.5 to seven? Because that's the thickest part of that particular graph. That means we have more availability of the minerals. Uh, that's why, and also the, the microbes are much more active at a 6.5 to seven. So if we don't swell test, we have no idea what we have. We could be putting on lime fertilizer and maybe put too much on, maybe not the right amount. And so, and you can read on that side, it also talks about uh, uh, the three numbers on a bag of fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphate, potash. And uh, so on the right-hand side, these are some average values. 
that says hay and pasture, but really it applies to lawns also. Um, one inch of uh, rainfall, for example, if you have an acre a yard, 27,000 gallons of water. Now just think of how much water that is if we could just keep it on our property and have it slowly uh, react and, and help keep our grass healthier. And, and if you notice, uh, uh, pH would be 6.3 to 7, phosphorus maybe 50 to 90. If you go back to the other slide, we were down to 10. And so these are some really good numbers right here. Now at the bottom there I have, uh, if you do get a report from a lab, it's in PPM, you can take PPM times two equals pounds per acre. And then you can use this chart to see what some good numbers are. We better keep moving on. I'm sorry, it's taking, taking a little bit longer than we thought. Okay, let's look at the next one. All right, Taylor. All right, now here's here's a bag of fertilizer, left-hand side. Uh, right above that, see the big guaranteed analysis? Look up above there, it says 3004. Now, what's that zero in the middle? Remember the previous slide we looked at, it said nitrogen, phosphate, potash. So if we have a zero, and this, and this is lawn fertilizer, very common to any other type of lawn fertilizer, the 3004, that means there's nitrogen, 30%, zero means there's no phosphate whatsoever in this lawn fertilizer. And this is the same, if you go to any box store, look at all the lawn fertilizers, whether it's, a, they all have their four-step programs. Every one of those is gonna be a big zero in the middle. And why did they do that? They don't want any extra phosphate coming off of your yard into the storm sewer, into the creeks, the rivers. And so they just took it out. But what if you have a soil test that says, I need some phos phosphorus is so important. It's good for root development. It's good for the overall health of the, the plant. So if you just put on this lawn fertilizer and you have a, a deficiency of phosphorus in your, in your soil, that means your grass is stressed. And number one, you're not gonna have a strong root development. And then you're gonna have uh, scattered uh, blades of grass around. So if you do get some rainfall, you're gonna get some erosion of that soil going right off of your yard. Now that's where the best topsoil is, is on the top. So pay attention to that. And, and if you do need some phosphorus, we're gonna to have to go to an ag supplier to get some. Now, one more slide on the right-hand side, pelletized lime. If you do need some lime, it'll tell you whether we need high calcium lime, high magnesium lime, which also equals dolomitic. But uh, the only thing we can really put on our yard, if you want to use a spreader or a drop fertile or lime spreader, we have to use pelletized lime. And if you want to find this on your on your website, um, you can go to uh, Michigan State. This is a research article they did, and they're comparing pelletized lime versus the, the regular ag lime, which is a real powdery stuff. And a pelletized lime costs a lot more, but it's the only thing you can really get to put on with an applicator in your yard. And all this article says is that if it says 37 pounds per thousand square feet of lime, if you use pelletized lime, you have to use the same amount because uh, one pound of pelletized lime is actually going to be the same and equal to one pound of your regular uh, granular lime, although it costs more money. And But I just want to point that out that be sure to use the same amount. Okay, number 10. All right, thank you. I'm all finished. But again, if any questions at the very end, I will stay here as long as you want me to. But um, that's pretty much uh, real quickly the importance of, of uh, doing those things. So uh, Taylor, Rob, why don't you continue on and I'm going to sit here and listen. All right. Thank you, Gary. A lot of good information, a lot of vital information. So thank you. So big question, should I rake my leaves or not? Um, there are some benefits to, to leaving your leaves on your yard. Um, as you can see here, um, it helps provide um, uh, nutrients back to your soil. It also can help suppress some weeds. Um, and it's also a good uh, source for wildlife, uh, whether that be nesting material, food, um, anything like that. Um, however, there are some downfalls to leaving leaves. And so, as you can see here, these are called brown spots. And so, sometimes either thinning them that, thinning your leaves out throughout your yard, if you don't wanna break them up, that you can do that. Um, just spread them out pretty thin uh, throughout your yard. It's not gonna, um, cause this but what causes this is just the the multiple layers on top of uh one another one another um 
And so I actually, I have this problem at my house. Our neighbor has some pretty big oak trees. And when it comes fall time, all those leaves fall right onto, onto my yard. And I have like a little, little divot in my yard um, that they just kind of collect right there. So I've, I made the mistake one year of just leaving them. I didn't do anything with them. And that little spot in my yard looked like this. Actually, it looked much worse than this. Um, so what I've been doing, I don't rake my leaves up, but I thin them out throughout my yard. I take my leaf blower, I thin them out, and that has helped prevent uh, these brown spots that are caused by thick masses of leaves that are fallen. Um, so that's, if you, that's, you know, there's a bunch of uh, different ways that you can get rid of uh, your leaves. You can compost them, which I think is the next slide and Rob is gonna get pretty involved in that. So you can compost them, you can thin them out, or if you want, if you don't like the, the look of leaves, you can pick them up, break them up. And there's some, uh, I don't know if that's the next slide or not, but um, there's some uh, people around, there's some companies around uh, Wooster that can pick them up. And I know a lot of trash services, they, they do a bunch of that. Um, and we'll have all this information um, available to you after this presentation, but um, we'll end with that. I think, yep, it is composting. So Rob, I'll let you take take care of composting. Thanks, Taylor. I know about those divots. Boy, that's one way to really find out if you have a low spot on your property because we just have a slight low spot in our front yard right near the driveway and the sidewalk and the leaves collect there and you wouldn't even know when you're looking at it in the summertime, but uh, come fall, that's where they collect. So I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, so now that we have all these leaves, these fall leaves, and then we've got grass clippings and we've got shrub clippings and small twigs. So what are some things that we can do with them? So one thing that we can do is compost them. And so, um, the good thing about composting is so so that you don't have to bag those up and haul them away or put them in the trash. And so it's just a way to process this yard waste on site at your property. So um, yeah, one of the things that you uh, can put into compost is the yard waste. So we talked about that. So that would be the, the shrub clippings, the grass clippings, um, or the dead leaves or the small twigs. Um, Another thing that you can put in the compost is food waste. So um, instead of putting those vegetable peelings or fruit peelings or eggshells in the trash where they will um, go to a landfill and create methane as a byproduct, which is a greenhouse gas, you can put them in with your compost, uh, in with the yard waste. And then in the end, when this yard waste and um, food waste breaks down, you get compost, which you can use as potting soil or as a soil amendment. So if you're going to compost, you need to contain that compost. And so you can have a container or a bin. Obviously, as you can see on this slide, there are a lot of different options for composting. Uh, but the key functions of the composter are to comp contain the waste, of course, um, to allow airflow, to be able to rotate it, and then to regulate the moisture that goes uh, onto your pile or in your container. So uh, what's going to kind of dictate the size of your compost bin will be the amount of yard and food waste that you have, and then maybe just the available space that you have on your property. Um, a composter can be purchased or you can construct it. Uh, it all depends on how much money you have, how much uh, know-how you have, and uh, um, your available um, property or available land to put it on. So our uh, office had some experience with a couple of different types of composters in the last year. The one on the left that you see spinning around is a tumbler type compost bin. We purchased that from a local home improvement store, and uh, it is a two, it ha has a divider down the middle, so it's a two compartment bin, you can see the two different doors. It's about uh, six cubic feet of volume, and uh, it costs about $80, and it took two people about 45 minutes to put together. 
and we put it right outside our door here at the office so that we can put our um, our vegetable and fruit scraps in it uh, from lunch and uh, it's very easy to access and very easy to spin. And then on the right side is a compost bin that my daughter and I constructed in the spring of last year. And so it uh, has about four times or five times the volume that Tumblr has. It's about, it's about three by three by three. So it's about 27 cubic feet. And we already had some of the four by fours and a staple gun and some um, fence slats that we had used for making a fence previously. So we had to purchase the other materials, which was the screening and the two by fours and some screws. And so uh, to purchase the other materials that we needed, it cost about $60. And uh, the time it took for us to go and get the materials and then construct it was about three hours for two people to put it together. And I am quite sure that if you are more me mechanically inclined than myself and my daughter, you can do it in less time than that. So now you've got your bin. So what do you put in it? So what you want to do is, is kind of balance it out between the browns and the greens. And the ratio of the browns to greens should be about four to one or three to one browns to greens. So the browns are material that has a lot of carbon content in it and the greens provide the nitrogen for your compost. So we kind of broke it down on this slide what the browns and greens were. So your main yard waste browns would be dead or fallen leaves in the fall. Um, or maybe sawdust or wood chips. Uh, things that you can take from your household then would be uh, coffee filters or shredded up or torn up paper or shredded up cardboard as well. The key is to really make it into smaller pieces because you're trying to ultimately break it down. So you can't just throw a box in there, a cardboard box in there. You wanna have it small so it, it breaks down. And then some of the greens that you would have would be some of your fresh grass clippings or fr fresh shrub clippings. Also uh, the fruit and vegetable scraps and eggshells. And even uh, if you've got a dog, you might have like we do, uh, that sheds a lot, you might be able to scoop up some uh, dog fur and put it on there as well. Um, and then your coffee grounds would actually be the green. So your coffee filters would be a brown and the coffee grounds would be, would be a green. Okay, so we know what to compost. So what shouldn't we compost? We don't want to do all this work and then foul up our compost. So the things you want to avoid are things you kind of think about what might attract some animals or rodents that you don't want. So any of the meat, the fish, the poultry scraps, you want to avoid putting those into your compost bin. Any dairy products you want to avoid as well as fats and oils and greases from the kitchen. So unfortunately, you have to find some other place to discard those uh, rather than the compost. Also, you want to avoid pet wastes, which could introduce some bacteria into the compost. And then any yard trimmings uh, that were treated with chemicals or pesticides so that that won't, uh, won't go into your compost product. But... So kind of the lessons we learned, we feel like we're kind of novices, but we're learning at, at each day. Um, since we just started last year, but uh, some of the lessons that we've learned were uh, in both of our bins, we had some larger sticks that we put in and they just didn't break down very well. And so and they kind of get in the way of turning the compost. So we took a lot of those big sticks out, smaller the better, just like I said, you know, tearing up the cardboard and the newspaper shredding, the smaller you can make the pieces, the, the better they're going to break down and make a more consistent compost. Um, you learned that corn cobs get taken out of the compost bin if you don't have it covered by squirrels. They really like corn, apparently. And uh, also, I put some bread on our compost bin at home, and I realized I saw about 50 birds circling. So if you do put the bread in, shred it up and, and turn that under a little bit so it's not just sitting on top. Um, also, if you put too many greens on top, kind of like you see on the bottom right slide, and you don't turn those under, you're going to start attracting some flies. So you'll want to do that. Um, but some of the positives that we found, uh, you can see on the top right how um, 
how much we all those leaves and fruit scraps broke down uh, to November there. And then on, on the bin, the home bin on the bottom right too, uh, we put all of our food scraps in for about six or seven months. We put a lot of yard waste in and we never really got the product yet. We'll see how it turns out in the spring, but um, the, there's just a tremendous amount of reduction in the food waste uh, that you throw out in the trash. All right, so we're kind of winding down. Um, so ultimately, with everything that we've been talking about, what if you can't compost or manage your yard waste anymore? Um, and you see to the right there, we have some uh, local companies that can uh, help you with that. And again, this will all be available to download. Um, so how do you get rid of your waste? You could compost it like Rob was saying. Uh, you can look, you can check your local trash collection uh, service or any other services around the area for yard debris pickup. I know a lot of them um, just, yeah, around Wooster um, will, will help you with that. Or you can burn it. Now, with burning, um, you would definitely want to take a look at this document. It's, the, it's, a, it's a document from the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. And this is a very good brochure that they put together. Um, you can see there on the bottom, it has the state of Ohio, all the counties, um, and it has contact information. Um, so if you have any questions at all, um, there's some contacts that you can uh, call. Um, and it just has some general health concerns, other restrictions, you know, what open burning, is never allowed. It has a lot of good information. Um, and so with that, and then with all of these things, the slideshow itself, um, and also a couple other things that we didn't touch, um, touch on uh, today will be available for you to download or uh, read, print off, however you would like to do that. Uh, so I think we have a little bit of time. Yeah, we have a, about 20 minutes. Um, I want to thank Gary with Holmes Lab uh, for speaking. Um, we appreciate it very much. Uh, and if you have any questions, now would be the time to do that. Looks like we have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, one is, how about hardwood ashes? Are those okay to add to the compost? Uh, if not, is there any other use for them? Yes, uh, yeah, um, my understanding is that I have not put that on our composter, but uh, I believe that is something that you can put into the compost and uh, that it does break down pretty well. Actually, I, I know, um, with the fur and hair, I saw that uh, that's something that uh, takes a little while to break down, but um, the hardwood ash would be something that you could put in the compost bin. I think we had another one. Um, so this is a question. We live in a wood, so our grass does not grow very well. Um, Plus, we built a building, so we have a lot of dirt, which could, which I would like to gra make grass. Um, any suggestions on growing grass other than what you have already provided? Uh, yes, uh, the very common question. We love our trees around our, our property. And one thing that we find out is um, when the trees are small, the grass might be doing well. But why is it when the trees expand and they get taller, the canopy increases, they tend to, uh, not only do they have huge root systems that go under all of the yard and they're pulling in moisture and nutrients, but also uh, one of the largest uh, challenges is as the trees grow larger, they collect so much sunlight that less sun actually hits the grass. And we tend to have uh, grasses that are stressed because we have so much of the sunlight is blocked by the trees. And again, remember the, the grass does need the sunlight for the photosynthesis. So it, it takes a balance many times of, uh, sometimes we need to have a, a person come in and 
uh, not just start cutting off branches, but there are um, uh, foresters that really know how to prune. And they might prune some of the, the trees and allow more sunlight to come through. But uh, we would suggest that now many times when you build a building also, uh, they take a lot of that subsoil, which has a high clay content and they might push that back and landscape it. Uh, one way to find out how much clay you have is just take a spade shovel and push it down into the yard and push it down to about four or five inches, take the handle and bend it away from you and just look at the profile. Because the, the really good topsoil is gonna be that nice black top, uh, black type of soil. If you push the handle away and you see primarily uh, this brown, yellow, clay type of situation, it can be very difficult to grow grass. Um, you might want to um, add some other additional topsoil, maybe three or four inches, but if you have primarily clay in your yard because of they put a new building up and they, they just all they did was bulldoze around what was left over, um, you want to take a tiller and you, you want to till that, that yard area uh, maybe till it about one inch and, and, and then you put your topsoil on top of it, about three to four inches, if you do have a lot of clay. Now, another way to do it would be just to uh, follow the soil testing, uh, the collection uh, paperwork we had there and find out uh, what is the, the soil. Uh, many times, if you have a really low pH level and, and that one graph, I, I wish you had more time, that horizontal graph. If you look at when the pH is uh, less than 5.5, You'll notice that the, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium line gets really small. That means less availability of the minerals are going to be getting up into the blade of grass. So if you do a soil test, you find out I need some lime. And when you put lime on, what that does is increase the pH over to about 6.5 to 7. And if you do a soil test and you find out you need lime or fertilizer, the first thing you're going to do then is again, mow it really high with a really sharp mower blade. So we shear off the top of the blade of grass. And that one picture Taylor had about when you have a dull blade, it looked really rough. And what it does, it allows a lot of uh, diseases like funguses to get into your yard, but also it doesn't seal itself off and you get more evaporation of water coming out of the blade of grass. I remember we want to, when you mow it with a real sharp mower blade, the natural waxes in a blade of grass is going to seal off the top of that blade of grass. So we, we maintain the highest level of moisture in that blade of grass. So if, if you do a soil test, before you put anything on, we need to aerate it again to bring out those hard, those hard plugs of clay. That's when you apply the correct amount of lime and fertilizer and even a half inch of a really nice compost. And the compost adds more major minerals, trace minerals, microbes, uh, carbon, organic matter to down into that, that place where the plug was. So that would be the suggestion of, of what to do and also try to do some pruning of the, of the, uh, the trees to let more sunlight come in. Uh, anytime they did some re-landscaping with a bulldozer or a backhoe, if you have nothing but clay, and you'll find this a, a lot around the foundational plantings around houses, where we have about four foot out from the foundation, we try to put in some perennial shrubs or something, and they just don't grow. Many times it's nothing but clay right there. And some of the landscapers are actually digging out like a four foot area around the house is about a foot deep, getting all that clay and subsoil away from the foundation of the house, backfilling with some really nice topsoil, and then replanting the shrubs. So uh, does that answer the question? I hope that was helpful for uh, someone that, um, but we have a lot of places where the trees are beautiful, uh, but it, do you want to grow grass or you want to grow trees for shade? And sometimes that compromise, uh, we have to prune out the trees in order to let more sunlight come in, but also it's important to maintain our yard with the, all the things we talked about. You want to give that grass the best opportunity to get nice and thick uh, that we can. And remember those great big tree roots are coming underneath there and they're hungry. They're hungry for water and nutrients. So we have to make sure that the, the yard has everything in it that's gonna be satisfying to growing a healthy grass. Looks like we have a couple more. Um, okay, here's one. Do eggshells attract critters? Uh, we've read that the caffeine in coffee grounds and tea bags stunts growth of plants enhanced with uh, compost. Um, any comments yeah do you have critters around with the with the eggshells running around and have you noticed uh any sort of 
uh, stunting or anything with coffee grounds at all? I have not seen any evidence of the critters with the eggshells, to be honest with you. And we have a lot of squirrels in our backyard and a lot of other, there's a lot of scat in the backyard that's not from our dog too. So um, the only thing like I've seen that's been drug out of our bin has really been that, those corn cobs. So, uh, but you would think, like I said, you know, we're supposed to avoid eggs, but eggshells are okay. So obviously you're gonna have some egg on the eggshells, but have not seen any evidence of, uh, of the um, eggshells attracting any rodents. Um, as far as the caffeine, boy, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I guess caffeine, I, I could see where that might be a problem. I do not know, but um, if you'd like to send your, uh, send your question to our email address, we can look that up and, and get a little more information on that for you. I know we put some in our office composter, um, but we have yet to do anything with it. So I'm thinking this spring, we'll probably go down to our, our fair barn at the fairgrounds and uh, maybe spread some stuff on our flower beds in the back there. So we'll see, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll definitely uh, experiment with that. Um, let's see, I think we have one more. Uh, does kitchen, or does yard and kitchen waste generally end up acidic or basic? Um, is it a good idea to somehow test the pH of compost before using it as a potting soil? Yeah, I did a quick Google search on this question. I didn't know the answer to this, but um, from what my understanding is that it is more on the acidic side and maybe Gary, I'm sure Gary would say, yes, test the potting soil, but I don't know if you can shed any more light on that, Gary. Well, we, we do have a, a test for um, compost after you get done composting and everything is completely composted and uh, you put your hand into the compost, you can no longer recognize any of the ingredients that you put in. Uh, we do have, but, um, but for the small amount of compost, uh, uh, the test is quite expensive. And, uh, and when you think about uh, the compost, the main idea you're, you're trying to promote, Robbie, just to to keep everything on your property and compost. And, and, and when you compost, you're, you're gonna be adding, a, even on a perennial uh, flower bed or perennial brushes, uh, no more than about a half inch that you're gonna be working in. So whether the pH is a, a five, six or seven, when you put such a small amount in all of the topsoil in your, your perennial beds, uh, it would not be enough to, to really affect it that much. And so I, I would just uh, make sure you compost it. And, and if another idea would be to uh, get one of those composting thermometers. Um, it's um, a temperature probe. It's probably a couple of feet in, in length. And when you the proper compost uh, with enough, uh, like 60% moisture and you have the greens and the browns in there, uh, it, it heats up. And if you put a, a temperature probe in there, and if it comes up to 140, 150 degrees, uh, the nice thing about that, it, it's, uh, it's going to be killing all the pathogens, any weed seeds, the good microbes, again, they're aerobic microbes, the same microbes that help to um, digest the thatch in the yard and the grass clippings, the aerobic ones there, are actually the very same aerobic ones that uh, compost uh, requires. That's why when you, if it rains real heavily and, and your compost pile just flattens out, uh, when a compost pile gets so saturated with water, it actually pushes the oxygen out. That's why you go in and you, you fluff it back up again to try to get that oxygen back in there. That's what those aerobic microbes need. So the idea is to maintain that proper uh, composting technique, put the long temperature probe in 140 degrees on the inside uh, for about a week. That means you're getting proper composting. But remember the outside of the pile is still cold at a lower temperature, so somehow maybe in a, a bin beside of it, you wanna take the in, in, internal part of it, which got really hot, you start that on another pile and then the outside part of it, you put down on the pile, which then um, becomes, uh, you flip it around. So the, the outside actually becomes the inside and the inside, which was hot, becomes the outside. But when it raises up in temperature and, and everything's broken down properly, and if you put a small amount, mix it in with your perennial beds or with some potting soil, um, I think it'll be fine. Uh, we do a compost test for folks that are doing uh, like on a farm or 
commercial operation where they have great big windrows and they want to know what's the final carbon to nitrogen ratio, what's the major trace minerals in it, how much uh, NPK is in it. Uh, those are the ones that we do the uh, our compost analysis on so that they know, uh, for example, is it completely composted. But but Rob has a lot of good ideas how to do it at home. And, and I would just uh, take a temperature probe and make sure it's completely composted. And the pH level, uh, again, it, it varies depending on what ingredients you put in. But most of the compost we test are usually between six and seven, which is very good for a majority of our plants. And it's good for grass and good for plants. But again, you're, you're putting it on at a small level. And whenever you put compost on, just keep it away from the, the main uh, stem of the plant. Just keep it a few inches away. But, uh, but compost is such a good way of, of just uh, using things at home rather than throwing them out. Is there any more questions, Taylor? That you can um, I think that's it. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, if anyone would like to unmute themselves, please feel free. Um, I think we, we have about six more minutes, so. Um, I've got some additional questions uh, that we accumulated over the years. And, well, and again, please, if anybody else wants to talk, just uh, tell Taylor, but. Uh, a couple of things, uh, Taylor, you were talking about the trouble with leaves in the, in the fall time. Uh, many times we, we try to blow them off, we try to collect them, but um, getting back to the importance of that mulching mower blade, I read some articles where uh, in the fall time, when the leaves start coming down, uh, you take your, your mower out there with the mulching mower blade and what that does, and, and the leaves, if they're dry, now if they're wet, it doesn't work so good, but if they're dry, when you run over your yard with your mulching mower blade, you're really actually pulverizing those leaves. And again, just let them fall down into between the grass, the blades of grass. And again, that's food for the microbes. So instead of uh, trying to rake them all off and put them in a compost bin, if we don't have a compost, we don't wanna pay for somebody to pick them up, which is additional expense. Uh, when it's really nice and dry and many times the wind's blowing and you know they're dry, take your mulching mower blade out there and just really pulverize them. And, and that'll be food for the microbes. Uh, another couple of things is uh, what time of the year do we soil test? Again, we wanna go down four inches. Uh, anytime, uh, even in the springtime, for example, um, if the soil uh, thaws out, uh, we can collect soil samples in the spring. You can do it in the fall. Uh, summertime, it's a little bit hard to take soil samples because it's usually really hot and dry, but. You can actually take soil samples anytime. And uh, again, it's, um, uh, and how, when you, when you put on lime, for example, how long does it take to actually increase the pH? And we're looking at maybe a half a year, a year, year and a half, because we're putting on that lime, which is calcium carbonate, and it has to uh, penetrate down into the soil and actually raise the pH. And so you might be looking at a half a year, a year to actually raise the pH up. Often do we soil test if we have, if we get a report back and it has some corrections. Remember the corrections are very conservative. Um, you might want to put on, and, and do we put all the, the nutrients and, and, and lime on at one time? Uh, many times it's good uh, to put some on uh, maybe uh, Memorial Day where you plug it, you put on maybe half of the recommendation, maybe in September 1st, Labor Day, you plug it again, put on the other half of the recommendation. It's good to spread it out rather than putting everything on. If you go to the garden centers, you'll find these four-step programs and they actually tell you put some on in early spring, a little bit in early summer, late summer, and then in the fall. An idea is to feed your yard a little bit at a time. So the whole idea is to, if you look at that one paperwork, it says how many thousands of gallons of water can actually, you if, if you just think about in creating an environment that when it rains, it all stays on your property that is so much more beneficial than trying to sprinkle your yard with uh, once a, a day or per week, rather than running all that off. And if we can just create an environment that uh, the grass gets so thick, and again, it's competition, the weed seeds are laying out there. You'd be surprised how many weeds are just looking for an opportunity to grow. But if the grass is so thick, the weed seeds aren't gonna germinate and then you don't need to buy all of the herbicides to put on to treat that. Um, so again, it's, it's a bit of a challenge and it starts with testing, plugging, putting on the right lime fertilizer. 
and try to find there's different compost uh, companies around that um, have some, uh, they might use an animal compost, chicken litter or, or horse manure or something like that. Those usually have higher levels of N, P, and K. But again, if you plug it and put on uh, maybe a quarter inch or half inch of that, and they actually have these applicators that you can have a big hopper that you can actually apply it on. But just think of all of that going down into where the root system is, allowing the root system to expand and mowing it real high on top. It, when you mow it at three and a half inches, it's like being out on the beach. It's really, really hot out there. But what if you sit on the beach and you have one of those great big beach umbrellas that you're sitting underneath it? Same temperature, but with the beach umbrella, you feel so much more comfortable sitting underneath it. That's what the soil feels like when you have a nice three and a half inch high of grass and it's really, really thick. The temperature is cooler. And then when you plug it, when it does rain, we get the water down into there. And that one chart that has that horizontal um, uh, for availability of minerals, it, study that again when you print it off, because why is it when we have a pH of five to five and a half, we get less availability of the minerals. I remember the minerals are in the soil, but availability means it's getting up into the root system. So at a lower pH at five or five and a half, the minerals are there, but they're not water soluble. And the only way we get minerals up into the, the blade of grass, which provides all of the uh, chemical reactions that are going on, they has to, the, the minerals have to be dissolved in the water and then transported up into the root system, up into the blade. That happens at 6.5 to 7. The microbes are much more happier. They're going to grow and reproduce and get higher numbers. And, and so everything just works so much better if you understand uh, the importance of Swell testing, plugging, applying just what you need. And Rob said this at the very beginning. If you put something on that's not needed, it's very wasteful. If we don't put the correct amount on that gives us a well-balanced competitive uh, area for our yard, it's very wasteful too. Because if we have a deficiency of a low pH or not proper nutrients, it's, we're not going to get a real thick stand. I don't care if you melt three and a half, it's not going to be thick. We're going to get erosion. And remember, the best topsoil is right where that thatch layer is. The highest organic matter, the best topsoil. We do not want that to run off. And how many times this spring we're going to get these real heavy rains and along the, the ditches, we're going to see this real muddy water. So you sure want to talk to the soil and water to try to prevent that and keep all of that on our yards. And if you have pasture field, it all works the same way. Uh, uh, those are just some questions that, that we have. Uh, again, I'll, I'll be glad to stay as long as uh, there might be any other ones, but uh, print off some of that paperwork that, uh, that you have and, and just read some of that and try to get an understanding. And if you have any other questions, uh, get a hold of uh, Rob and Taylor. And if, if they want to email me or something, I'll, I'll try to uh, give a little more input if it is needed then. Looks like we don't have any other questions. Um, yeah, but I want to thank yeah you, Gary, uh, for speaking. A lot of great information, a lot of very helpful information. Um, there's stuff that you were saying that I didn't even know about. So I appreciate it very much. And um, yeah, if anyone uh, would like to contact him directly, uh, please feel free. His contact information is right here. Um, or if you want to contact us, kind of pick our brains or ask uh, any questions. Um, our information is there as well. Um, and again, all this stuff, even the slideshow, um, will be on our website for download uh, by the end of this week. Um, so if uh, you don't see that or if you're unable to uh, access that, just call our office and um, I can help you through that. So. I think we are good. I don't see okay. any other things in the chat. So thank you everybody for attending. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much everyone for uh, participating. Thank you again, Gary, as well. You're most welcome. Thank you. I'll stop recording.